This gives me a lot of pleasure then uh, to introduce our, our poet uh, tonight. David was born in uh, 1942 in the, the low California desert. So uh, that means that was the same year I was born. So that means I know how old David is. <laughs> He took degrees from the University of California, Santa Barbara in the 60s, taught English and reading in the public schools in San Diego, and then Eugene, Oregon. Went to law school from there at the University of Oregon and practiced law in various forms and places in Oregon until he retired in 2010. He has published poems in uh, various journals uh, throughout the country. He's also published Night Verse, 2005, The Landscape There, 2009, Weather Patterns, which is a book of short poems in 2011, uh, Housekeeping, Sonnets of the Pacific Northwest from Finishing Line Press in 2012, and The Fear of Love in 2013. And so there are some of those books that, that are here for, uh, for sale. He lives in Selwood with his wife, Marlene Anderson, who creates, created and directs the Imani Project, which is working with villagers in coastal Kenya on HIV AIDS prevention, orphan support, and related matters. So Marlene has a, a website that will tell you more about the, uh, the Imani Project and proceeds from the sale of David's books are donated to the project's Orphan Support Fund. So I've been looking forward to the, uh, the reading. Uh, we are delighted that, that you're all here, especially on a, uh, a, a dark night. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our poet for tonight, David Feiler. David. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Tom, and really thank you all for coming. It would have been an easy night to think of something else to do, like uh, nothing. Um, um, it is a pleasure to be here, and um, I want to thank the Poetry Committee for including me on the, uh, the list of readers for this eighth uh, season of the readings here. Uh, as Tom mentioned, um, there are books for sale, and they do the proceeds from the books uh, get donated to my wife's project in uh, Kenya, and uh, specifically to the Orphan Support Fund. And there's a whole story behind all of that, of course. And she's here, and there are some little pamphlets back there also that can give you kind of a synopsis of what the program's doing. Um, Yeah, let's see. I've um, tried to design a program for tonight's uh, reading that uh, provides kind of a sample of my work over the years, different forms, different subjects, uh, uh, different settings that I use. Um, so I'll um, get started. I would like to open and close the reading with a poem that has something to do with uh, the Imani Project and my role in it, which is basically to stay home and keep the home fires burning. Uh, and um, well, we'll see what happens as the program goes along. But um, the first poem I'm going to read is the poem on the broadside. And, um, the first time Marlene went to Kenya was not about uh, HIV AIDS um, crisis that they were facing there. It wasn't about orphans or anything like that. You went with a group of people to look at wildlife. It was a safari. And um, they did see lots of wildlife, the giraffes, the rhinoceroses, the elephants, whatever, the, whatever they are there. I've never been. Um, but when the trip got to these villages on the coast of Kenya, she got introduced to people and a problem that really changed her thinking about what she should do with her time and has kept her going back there and for something like a decade now. And uh, so um, the poem on the broadside is uh, called Shining Back and it was my attempt real early on to make some sort of a poetic statement about her, the epiphany that she 
uh, had while she was over there. So here it goes, shining back. I see you there, shading your eyes, the evening Serengeti sun shimmering in the day's remaining heat. Something is out there, soaring or gathering around a carcass or knee deep in a watering hole. It doesn't matter. It's all too far off and lost in diminishing layers, the plane blending into the sunset beyond the farthest point you can see. There in that farther landscape is what you came for. The other, the out of place, the grain that is the least and most of what can be seen. And it is there, shining back with its own light into your eyes. I see you turning, climbing into the truck, the dusty road, the clear, cold, earth-circling air, touching down in our green northwest, what you've seen still there as you come toward me and your eyes meet mine. As Tom mentioned, uh, Marlene and I live in the Selwood neighborhood. We're almost citizens of Milwaukee. Uh, we live <laughs> we're pretty much at the very bottom of the Selwood neighborhood and uh, uh, on Lynn Street, and we have a lovely view of the PGE high voltage uh, <laughs> corridor, uh, the Oregon Pacific <coughs> Railway, and occasional trains going back and forth, not too, not too often. Um, used to be the trolley barns were pretty much across the street from the old Portland trolley system, but they've, over the years, have been replaced by condominiums. And the other, used to be other dilapidated sort of semi-industrial structures over there. And um, so it's kind of on the rough edge of things. And so here is a uh, pair of linked sonnets, a little rough in their own way, uh, called Lynn Street Pastoral. First sonnet, late Saturday night. We plan much needed rest, closed blinds, book curtains against the summer sun, mornings finally dawning warm and cloudless, the bedroom facing east. Program the alarm for silence, but it's too strong. Habit prevails, overpowers intentions, expectation, duty, ingrained, entrained in compliant minds, the rails of every workday morning haul us away out of our sweet dreams precisely at the usual hour. Even sex won't release us back to sleep. And then there's the black cat. He's been out all night and will be fed, please. <laughs> Leisure takes practice. It takes skill, it takes luck. We try on Monday. Wake to the garbage truck. <laughs> Second. So much for Monday. After the garbage truck, the neighborhood's dog comes out for his morning pee and can't do it silently. <laughs> Someone walks across the street, dog barks ferociously. Then the train moving a few freight cars down to the warehouse across 17th Street. And then what? No matter. Noise leave deep scars from its constant attack. We admit defeat. The week takes us back, Tuesday, and on through the days, the usual, the tedious. Both of us sleep-starved, exhausted, wired, wound up tight, been real busy, expeditious, dog-tired. But now, the weekend's here, the best. Late Saturday night, we plan much needed rest. That brings us back to the beginning of that story. Um, the landscape across the street from us over the years has been, um, under the power lines, has been, well, you might say, natural. Um, but there are moments when, uh, when, when even the weeds can be pretty magical. And uh, this little poem celebrates such moments and it's called Jewelry. End of March, rain all day, but just at dusk the sun appears, glancing its colored light into a rainbow in the east, cherry petals fluttering here and there, 
sidewalks covered with them. New dandelions spangle the power company's grassy right-of-way like early yellow stars. An urgent scent of Daphne hovers in the cooling air. The devil crafts such evenings, threads their bright wonders together with vanishing time. Here, he croons, try these momentary jewels on the unheeding breast of your desire. Um, Salwood isn't home to as many antique shops as there were a decade or so back, but the number of coffee shops has increased. <laughs> and uh, one of those, I'm not singling it out as a favorite or anything, but one of those is called the Blue Kangaroo, and it's on Southeast 13th uh, Avenue. Uh, and they roast their own coffee there as well as uh, sell it. And one of their roasts uh, is called Selwood Morning Blend. And one day I was pouring myself a cup of that coffee and it dawned on me finally that that title had some poetic possibilities. Selwood, the specific location, um, morning, the time of day when some of our fantasies haven't yet dissipated into reality, and <laughs> all of that blended together. And so the poem that came out of it is called Selwood Morning Blend. And I'll thank Bill Siverly and his uh, Windfall magazine for publishing this one in its current or fall edition. So thank you, Bill. Selwood Morning Blend. Pretend the crown of noise from over the river is morning opening up her arms, not traffic on Highway 43 across the Selwood Bridge. Pretend the garbage trucks working Southeast Lynn Street at 6.30 a.m. are neighborhood carolers singing their way towards you to mark the dawning of a new spring holiday. <laughs> Pretend your lawn has reached its perfect height and stopped and your garden beds lie completely free of those stubborn dandelions. Pretend your house is clean and no major crises mar the morning headlines. Pretend the wait you hear standing at the signal 13th and Tacoma is your fervent lover imploring you to stay with her a bit longer. <laughs> Pretend the sky is clear the day warm but not hot. Pretend you're in the blue kangaroo and there's time for yet another cup, the caramel and spice of Selwood morning blend. <laughs> so the other neighborhood, if you will, or at least the area that affects, uh, informs, um, fills up a lot of my poems is the landscape the area of Puget Island. And if you're not familiar with Puget Island, it's a big island in the lower Columbia River, about 30 miles upriver from the ocean, uh, connected by bridge to the Washington town of Cathalamet, little nice little town, ferry to get you over to the Oregon side at Westport. Um, and it's a lush riparian landscape, constantly changing with the seasons, The rise and fall of the tide, which can be pretty extreme that close to the ocean. So there's a few poems that are where I use that landscape to um, try to make sense of something. Um, first one on my list is called Flotsam, and uh, Windfall Magazine published this one too in its fall edition, so it was a, a bonus for me. Uh, Flotsam. Kingfisher, perched on the alder branch, keen on the possibility of something coming near the surface, tide rising slowly below it, cycle of moon drawing the water up as high as it will come all summer, bearing a log or two that with luck will become lodged where it can be retrieved, dried, bucked and split and used as stove wood months from now. The hours come and go all bearing something worth looking at, sometimes worth getting a little wet for, salvaging, 
saving to satisfy an abiding hunger, perhaps only recognized at the moment when that something drifted into view. The peculiar chance of it, the phase of the moon, the tides, the afternoon sunlight, Kingfisher on that branch of all the others up and down the river, the way life brings the world's momentary treasures to our famished eyes as we search in the brief time we have before we too are carried on out of sight. And um, Once I had a, a house to go to there, one of the great pleasures was the next door neighbor. His name was Bob Reynolds. I don't know if any of you knew him while he was alive. He was a poet, an artist, a bookmaker, a wonderful conversationist. And uh, it was a great pleasure to go next door and just sit down and chat about something with him. But he uh, became afflicted with cancer, confined to his house, and one day while we were sitting in his living room, uh, he asked me a question, something like, what makes it worthwhile? And I didn't have an answer except to look uh, at what we were, just a gesture toward what we were already looking at through his big uh, living room window. That, and that, that, that moment um, eventually became a poem, and it's dedicated to Bob Reynolds. It's called The Landscape There. Carpets of water flag across the slough, bunching in yellow blossoms now in mid-May, like ripples of laughter, those coming on early, sensing the warmer days ahead. The silver mist still lying heavy in the creased hills and up along the palisades, holding their secrets. From his chair, he could see the lawn his sons mow, his dock, its gray boards, his red skiff rising, falling twice each day, recurrence of his tidal sleep, swallows cutting insects from the hazy air. Or looking eastward, to where last winter storms downed a line of trees and let the river be seen, just now, a large ship in view at Nassau Point, dark hull down on its lines, headed out to sea. A big man still stooped by his disease, red-edged eye, red eyes, his fine white hair just growing back. He asked me, and I could only answer with what we both could see in the landscape there the very green now shimmering on the water, cottonwoods backlighted in the morning sun, geese splashing down, drifting through his ebbing time. And um, although I don't know what the next few days are gonna bring, uh, we don't very often get snow here at our elevation, just close to the ocean. and even less frequently at the island being that much closer to the ocean and that much lower. But um, um, at Christmas time in 2001, uh, the end of a year when we really needed a hopeful sign, it did snow, it snowed quite a bit on the island. And um, this is a poem I made from it. It's called Snow Down River, and it has an epigraph from a Charles Wright poem. Called, his poem is called Disjecta Membra. And the epigraph I've used is, How hard to be as human as snow. Snow Down River. I haven't seen it snow this far down river in years. I know the occasional weather that makes it. Jet stream bends to the north, the last rain moves on east, and the valley fills with frigid air. Days of this under misleading sun, and then more rain freezing as it falls. And so this gift of snow, slowing like a message as it falls, spreading across the boggy river-rimmed fields, shading them first to gray, then white, 
than deeper white. It isn't why it snows. It's why it snows now. Snow some kind of sign for this year's end. Weather that unifies, defining gardens and grazing fields as one. Bare alder, ash and willow, lawns and dry river grass as one. Highway and road bending back to the barn as one until the island floats in silence and thought like hope for a quiet year, river flowing by and on down to the sea. Well, Puget Island landscape will show up in other poems, uh, but that, that was a group of them uh, that really benefited from it. Um, I'm going to move into some rain poems. I'm sure rain figures in the poetry of, <laughs> of many, many writers in the Northwest. Um, so here, here are a couple. Um, this is a little sestet that I, uh, I wrote a bunch of set sestets after reading through Charles Wright's book called Sestets. Nice book, very tempting little poems in it. And the title of the poem is Weather Patterns, and it the, became the title of one of the chapbooks back there. So even on a day in which there is no rain, the water is coming up and falling down. River and breath, tear in the lover's eye. Try January. Wait for a dry day and walk wherever your thoughts take you. See if you don't come back soaked. <laughs> <clears throat> and here's, a, here's one of the fairly infrequent free verse poems. Um, <coughs> of late, and I, uh, the structure of the title I borrowed from uh, the poet Lisa L. Mueller. Uh, her poem's title is A Short History of the Rose. The title of this one is A Short History of Rain. It only fell when it became too heavy for the clouds to bear. And then it had no choice, gathering where it fell clinging to anything it could, disappearing when there was earth to soak into. Someone likened it to tears, but by then the clouds had blown on beyond the horizon and sunlight reflected off the wet streets. In one part of the country, it raised rivers above their banks and there were second thoughts. But when a single drop fell from the blooming rose, everyone knew it was a gift. Those rain poems. Um, let's see, one of, uh, one of my favorite places to go in Portland is uh, Jimmy Max, the jazz nightclub Jimmy Max in the Pearl District. And uh, um, I've got a couple of poems here that uh, use Jimmy Max, at least my perception, perception of it, um, for their setting and subject matter in a way. Um, the fir first poem is called The Jazz at Jimmy Max, um, and the story behind it, my son graduated from college in 1999, and I saw him off that fall, uh, November I think it was, uh, to Atlanta to take a job that he'd gotten all by himself. Uh, I've tried to capture the, the mix of feelings I experienced at that moment using the experience of enjoying the jazz of the Mel Brown Quintet, which then and still performs at Jimmy Max on Thursday evenings. Um, Mel Brown and Louis Payne, the organist, and Thera Memory, who used to be the trumpet player for that band, are mentioned in the poem. Um, so. Here's the jazz at Jimmy Max. I see you, my now grown son, gathering your bags in Atlanta, the South's drawn out sound still warm in mid-November. You've traveled farther, but always with a round trip ticket in your hand. I hope the jazz at Jimmy Max is with you as you step out onto the sidewalk looking for a cab. 
It's been years like this, setting you off towards something neither of us knew for sure, opening some door, urging you through, standing back. Now you elbow through doors you've opened by yourself. You're 22 years unblemished by doubt. I hope the jazz at Jimmy Max is with you. Listen. Mel Brown's quintet is halfway through the early set, trumpet and tenor trading eight-bar breaks on windjammer. Louis Payne's Hammond growling subtly in support. It's Thursday night, a steady rain rolling down Everett Street. Cold, winter has returned to the northwest, and already it feels like it's been here forever. The clubs filling up, though, the bar crowded. Only the tables in the back aren't reserved. The room is warm and well-dressed, and there's a smart undertone that seems part of the act. A few couples can't resist. They put down their drinks and dance in the little space up near the stage. Listen. Thera's at it again, scatting through his horn close to the mic, telling some intricate story, a long, earthy secret that only he and the women have heard before. If you were here, I'd ask about your work, and you'd have plenty to say. The father, I'd give you room to play, see where you could take the theme, my comments spare and wise, noodling in the space you leave. Listen, now it's Mel himself taking off on Pygmy, setting down that funky, funky beat, then improvising with his old Motown rhythms, the band sitting back, waiting its turn, waiting for that moment when the tune's given back. Listen, wherever you go through the uncharted years to come, remember the jazz at Jimmy Max. The next set will just be starting when you return. This little poem is uh, called Devin Phillips at Jimmy Max. Devin Phillips is a saxophone player. He came to Portland from New Orleans when, after Hurricane Katrina. And he appears uh, periodically at various <laughs> places, including Jimmy Max. He's a wonderful saxophone player. And not so much now. He keeps pushing through the music as a good jazz musician will. But when he first came, you could really hear some of those New Orleans sounds in his music. The, blues and the march rhythms and tunes, and I tried to capture a little bit of that uh, in this poem that is in the form, I would call it a short pantoum uh, that I've noted in a poem by Natasha Trethaway. Uh, so here's Devin Phillips at Jimmy Max. His sounds born on the streets of New Orleans play across the stage here at Jimmy Max. First, a fervid march, then a haunting blues, music from every life the soul has lived. Sax sounds played across the stage at Jimmy Max, music of love, music of those left out, music from every life the soul has lived, dancing through the air and into the room, music of love of those left out of love, born on Beale Street, reborn in the wet Northwest, pulsing through the air and across the room, shaking out its raincoat, tapping its feet. Tunes from old Beale Street, relived in the wet Northwest. Now a funeral march, now a sexy blues, strutting out of raincoats into tapping feet. That night, our souls were all from New Orleans. Go see Devin Phillips if you get a chance. And this, um, I was hoping she would come, but because of the weather, I'm sure it's difficult. I was going to, I was hoping that Verlina Orr would be in the audience tonight. Wow. And um, I wanted to take a chance uh, and honor her and hopefully not embarrass her and get away with the last part of that anyway, probably. Um, um, in the late 1980s, uh, I had just recently come to Portland. I took a workshop 
up at Lincoln High School, and it was led by Verlina Orr. One of the sessions she brought in as a, I think the word is prompt, <laughs> um, a miniature replica of Rodin's famous sculpture, The Kiss, and we were all supposed to go do something with that. And so this is what I came back with, and ever since then it's been dedicated to Verlina. It's called Hands. I would rather kiss hands. Hands have done everything, been cold and burned, caressed and braced against a fall. Hands are dangerous, have become fists instinctively, gripped knives in anger, released bombs. And, uh, hands have felt pulse and pressed desperately against wounds. Hands have worn paint, grease, the pungency of garlic, scent of fresh sex. Hands have been hidden in pockets, left awkwardly exposed. Hands have bathed children, lowered the dead. Hands have scars where they have been cut preparing meals, have held shovels, planted seed, counted out change, signed over fortunes, condemned lives. Hands have slammed the door before there could be answers, squeezed the gate latch open, touched the starter, given the downbeat, stopped traffic. Hands have shaded eyes looking out to sea, reached when no one was there. Lips? Yes, lips, but I would rather kiss hands. That's to Verlina. <laughs> A couple of uh, parent poems, par poems about my parents, not being a parent. Um, at the end of their lives, my parents lived in Ojai, California, a little bit north of Los Angeles, separated from the ocean by a low ridge of hills. And um, my father died at 90, and this was a pair of sonnets that I was writing, started writing before he died, and the, they're uh, like the first one I read tonight. Well, it's linked together sonnets, and the second sonnet had to be changed a little bit as he got older until he did die at 90. So then it's stayed the same ever since. So here are two sonnets called Sonnets to My Father. First one, he's 84 and still he's going strong. That's what I say, but he complains of loss of strength. So he pushes out his daily walk a block, then two, and soon he's gone so long he cannot remember where he's been. Then it's yard work, laundry, and now he's in the car and off for groceries. He says, it's not far, never at night, he says, don't worry, I spend my time carefully. He says, I won't be wired again to that pulsing screen, that urine bag. That's your nightmare too, forget it. That sag in the last ridge seaward, see it? That's where I'll be when that sharp flutter comes again. He says, let's walk, bring your jacket, I smell rain. And the second sonnet, <coughs> and we still walk, though not really together, not to that last ridge where he stands and shows me the sea. He's more like a shadow now, thrown from behind, each year getting longer. And is it his, gaunt, stooping with a pot belly, or is it mine? Harder to tell each year. Harder to break the growing spell I thought I'd broken years ago. Not that I'm becoming him, I know better. Though sometimes it's him I see while shaving. And I hear his rasp in my own talking. Times made us distant and brought us closer. He's with me even when he's not along. He's passed on now, but still he's going strong. And here's a poem about my mother. Um, 
When she died, um, my older sister lived closest and drew the job of going to the house and going through the clothing and sorting things out and packing up what should be donated and so forth and so on. And when she let us know what she found, she was rather chagrined by how ordinary, uh, meager our mother's clothing were. And indication to us, I guess, of how much was sacrificed along the way. And this poem um, uses a form I found in Thomas Hardy's poetry, and it's called The Clothes She Wore. The clothes she wore, simple and old and few, hung in her closet, finely closed, as if an artist had composed and painted grays and blues her lifetime there. What did we know through all those years but that? The cotton and the wool, no silk. Her desires and fears, her silent will, disguised in a simple hat and dress below. Her heartbeat there, and always we knew our pressing cheeks and sleepy eyes, the warmth of her breast. But time went by as it was compelled to, and left them bare. They hold thin air now only, hanging cold and emptied of her daily life. They once held mother, friend, and wife. So simple, few and old, the clothes she wore. Uh, I've uh, included one prose poem in the program tonight. Um, it's called Crow Blackbirds, and it's another poem that uses a lot of the landscape and, uh, of Puget Island and surrounds. Um, and like perhaps, well, certainly many poets and maybe all poets, I'm guilty of misusing crows of, in my poetry. Uh, perfectly wonderful, interesting, gregarious, sometimes very humorous birds, but like many poets, um, I attribute qualities and characteristics to them that um, they don't deserve, and this is an example of that. I guess all that goes back at least to Edgar Allan Poe, and maybe <laughs> earlier than that, uh, but we're all probably guilty of it. And, um, so crow blackbirds, and actually this has an epigraph too from ornithologist P.A. Tavener in his book called Birds of Western Canada. He says, the crow blackbird is a poor bird to have about the house if other more attractive species are desired. <laughs> so here they are. They are here again this evening. They are always here, but it is evenings they gather as they are in that row of dark green pines across the road or in the cottonwoods at the corner of the property, the crows, the crow blackbirds. They have been here and they have been everywhere all day. They have been across the split river, its swirls and flotsam carried high with the tide and the spring flood to the Washington side where the Palisades give way to the west. Kathlamet then down to the slow Alakaman delta still full of winter ducks. They have stood beside the road, ebony heads shining, strutting out between pickups, the morning milk truck, the contract mail carrier weaving back and forth mailbox to mailbox. They've gathered some sustenance from the road's small casualties. They have sought out unprotected smaller lives from nests and dodged the red wings, frantic feints and thrusts. But when evening tilts the light low across the long green pastures, sheep now settled far back under the maples, a few white-tailed deer grazing in their place. When the clouds dissolve into the deckled sky and when the wind slows and steam from the Wana mill glows against the dark Oregon hills. Then they gather as they are, in the dark green pines or nearby cottonwoods, crows, crow blackbirds, 
like a raucous syndicate of nightmares waiting to enter into dreams. I was going to apologize to crows, but I included another crow poem. <laughs> so I'll hold my apology. This is called Analysis. Night is to a crow an invitation. Shadows grown up from underneath, suspect scent rising in the darkness. A crow will watch in the last light, but not for long. Sleep is to a crow as a door. Frame, hinge, latch, opening into the very dark it encloses. A crow will wait outside, but not for long. When you meet a crow at dawn, remember its eye. The yellow glint is the light that once was your dream. A crow will take what it needs, then move along. So my apologies. <laughs> Again, I'm probably in for it now. Um, I'm really a fan, like Annie Lightheart I know, is a fan of the short poem. Uh, I love the haiku, the quatrain, any little snippet of poetry that somehow communicates far more than the few words that it contains. And over the years, I've kind of collected little types of short poems, and I'll sample a few of those tonight. I have a collection of uh, haiku-formed poems, our version of the haiku, anyway, that I group under the title Regarding Darkness. So here's a couple of samples from that. After night begins, the day will never come back, so we stay up late. <laughs> Darkness is a thief. All those fascinating dreams, not a trace at dawn. And then this one has its own title called Winter Solstice, and it goes like this. How dark it is now, except for this rain-spangled tree and the spring within. There's also a collection of rhymed quatrains that I just call quatrains miscellany. There's a couple of those. Um, the goldfinch flew against our window, believing it blue sky and endless. Now it dries in the grass below, its horizons permanently descended. And these two I usually pair up under a title, Quatrains for the Year's End. So here's a pair of quatrains. Something is leaving. Can you hear? Rattling away as if draped in sear whispers and withered tears, muttering exhausted codger year. Something is coming. Can you hear? With scent of fresh leaves very near. There again, it is almost here, quiet, and have hope or it will disappear. Here's a, here's kind of a standalone short poem, a little risque dialogue in six very short lines. It's called Appraisals. Be careful, she said. I am fragile, like glass. No, fine crystal, he said, and rubbed with, <laughs> and with his wet finger, rubbed her till her edges sang. Don't think about it too much. <laughs> uh, still on the short poem section here, I'm really a fan of the poet Richard Wilbur. And um, I like all of his poems, long, short, um, very structured, very loose. Um, something about the mix of profundity and, and wit, and I mean wit in the best sense that I really enjoy in his work. And here's a little homage to Richard Wilbur that I included uh, as one of the postscripts in the book back there, The Fear of Love. It's 
poem's called Taken. I take my time reading, reading Richard Wilbur, captured by his wit, playful yet sober. A verbal nudge, a sly pun, almost fay, as if he knew I couldn't turn away. Would be entranced by joy as well as grief, his measured trust in love, however brief. More now, as my hair has turned to silver, I take my time and read Richard Wilbur. <laughs> and since I've gotten Richard Wilbur into the room now, I wanted to, well, whenever I get his collected poems out, I just can't resist going to the back of the book where uh, are included uh, some books he published ostensibly for children, and especially the ones called Opposites and More Opposites. And, um, these, and I, when I read them, I can't help trying to imitate them. Um, and these are funny little poems that usually start out asking about the opposite of some perfectly normal, common word, and, and then through a rather odd but pervasive, per, persuasive uh, logic comes to a different conclusion than I would have thought of. And I've, so I have in, imitated them from time to time. And here's a couple from my collection. Um, number five is, well, this is number five. For the opposite of quick, you know, you have two different ways to go. One of them is slow, as in ponderous. Think lumbering brontosaurus. Or a much slower beast instead, in which case it's probably dead. <laughs> this is number nine in my fairly short collection. It's not as easy as it may seem. Um, what is the opposite of wed? Yes, the institute of marriage, wherein lovers merge their baggage and haul both burdens down the road of life that once looked clear ahead. <laughs> Should one feel that's an overload, the opposite of wed is fled. <laughs> okay, well, here's a few poems as we get on in time that uh, don't fit very neatly into any category. Um, See, I guess I'll start with this one. Um, last month here, Henry Carlyle read his uh, amusing poem about airport security. And I had one by that time, too, uh, re result of trips from here to Chicago, where my son and his family lived, and going through the, the drill. And um, my poem is called this is maybe a developing genre of poetry, for all I know. It's, um, my poem is called Body Scan. I step into the humming arch, minus belt, shoes, keys, and coins, turn sideways and raise my arms. The TSA officer scans me up and down, inside and out. How much of me can she see? And what do I have to hide? Some aging flesh and a heart beating faster, a bit faster now. A few scars from my 72 years of life. Who knows what else? Can she see the ghost image of that collection of old regrets I carry with me somewhere under my skin, so deep inside that I hardly ever look Many I couldn't explain if I were called off to the side and required to. <laughs> Can she see those wayward thoughts that drift through my mind now and then, those fantasies conjured up to ease the tedium of real life? Foolish scenes of high passion and success. No, not even with today's keen technologies can those be seen, and even if they were, She'd merely and quietly scoff and send me on my way. Can she see that fragile wisp 
of a poem I woke up with this morning. Those two lines I knew in my sleep-wake state would lead to some prize-worthy peace. If so, I wish she'd take a second look, move closer where she could read them out, since as with most of my early morning brilliance, I'd lost them by breakfast time. <laughs> Can she see what I'm running from? I know it's close enough nipping at my heels when I slow my pace. It must be easy to see. No, none of those things that keep me awake at night, in motion when I have no pl nowhere to go. Just me there. And she can see I'm no threat to anyone traveling in any real life. She's seen it all, I suppose. And like most of us, longs for the day when she'll see some true evil revealed. Or, if not evil, which would require some real work on her part, at least something worth a bit of break room gossip with her colleagues. Not from me, though. Not today. I'm plenty burdened, but not noteworthy in that way. Thank you. Step on through, she says. And I do. I do as I'm told. Find my shoes, my belt, and keys, and head on down to my gate. I'm going somewhere. It says so right on my boarding pass. And there's no time to lose. <laughs> and um, here's, a, here's a little poem. That I'm still not sure what it's about, but it's called Messages. Messages. You could mistake them for anything. Whisper of bird flight above your head. Swirls just below the sun-streaked surface of a rising tide a low groan from back in the stand of cottonwoods next door, flashes along the horizon just after sunset, even real words, the ones you didn't expect to hear, not any longer. Though you've listened, you listen even when you travel, even when the ground is far below and all you can see are thin highways connecting the lights of sleeping towns. You listen, and try to parse the sounds, at times sure that they are old love songs, their tunes so sweet and so familiar, lyrics, the ones you can remember, regretting someone's faithless life, or solemn prayers, but you are unsure how long it's been since you heard a prayer or said one. Yet they could be prayers, a child's perhaps, veering close enough on its passage forth to distract you from what you had been thinking, almost close enough to be an evening breeze, or nothing, when silence takes their place. Messages. And I have a, a, a group of poems I, I call personae poems, poems, it's third person poems, he, she, they. Thing. And um, they may or may not reveal anything about the person who wrote the poem, but they're, they keep their distance. Uh, here's a little free verse poem called Calculus. Calculus. He waits discreetly until dark, then plays the skill he's gained through practice, honing his heart's bitter edge. Strong, the lonely soul, hungry for revenge. His last steps can barely be heard. And he looks back only to see how much distance is necessary to be missed. Um, here's a little two-part two story called Brief. And I think he got started reading the poem I take the epigraph from. It's a Theodore Retke poem called her words, and my epigraph that I use is, write all my whispers down. So this is brief, part one. She smiles and turns away, loves mystery too much to dwell on. Her thoughts stray to housework, books, and such stable things she knows well or had. Now even they have come under the spell she'd missed until today cold, 
She writes down whispers long after the reasons have been forgotten. Winter, longest of the seasons. Part two. He remembered her look, wondered why she had turned. It was his usual luck, not the first time he'd learned that moments dissipate before plans can be laid. Always a little late, he thought and he waited. Now he writes down whispers he can just barely hear over the storm. Winter, loudest of the seasons. And here's a little poem called Song, Salt and Sour. And that odd phrase, salt and sour, I got from a Boz Skaggs tune when he appeared in concert here. And unfortunately, I didn't make a note of the title of the tune, so I can't tell you what it was. But So song, salt and sour. She left home in salt and sour. She left there in a rage. When that night was finally over, she had to turn the page. It told a too common story, no happy ending now. She left there in pain and worry and can't imagine how she thought there was even a prayer their story would end well. She lives on in salt and sour, alone, but not in hell. So coming to a conclusion here tonight, um, I said I was going to read an Imani Project poem for opening and closing, and um, well, my, my wife Marlene actually asked to have this one read, and this poem is called In Darkness It Flashes, and it's not strictly speaking an Imani Project poem. Uh, I wrote it f to be read by my son at our wedding, but then I hoped, at least, it uh, said something about the optimism and the imagination and determination that's necessary to commit to a marriage relationship. And if it does, I think it also expresses something about the um, same um, ingredients that and um, personality that are necessary for someone like Marlene to commit to going back and back and back to the, these villages on the coast and helping people that are so different and so far away from us and really become part of their family there. So here's uh, In Darkness It Flashes, and it has an epigraph too from a Donald Justice poem. His poem is called Women in Love. And the lines I use are, to will it is enough to take them there. In darkness it flashes. She wanted, oh, and this is also a Puget Island set poem. And if you're walking on the road in front of the house at night in the summertime, there's all kinds of things going on that you can see and hear and um, wonder about. Um, and that's, that's what I was imagining taking place during, as I was writing this poem. In darkness it flashes. She wanted angels in her life with prayers like the soft movement of birds, susurrus of quick, accurate wings come back from some distant place, precisely when needed, lacing the still evening air. They came, and also f small green and yellow frogs chanting in the dusk from under dogwoods, from the muddy swale across the dike road, starting and stopping in unison, and on into the July night. Neither could she doubt that they were angels she was blessed with. These ephemera, these seasonal hymns in ditch and air around her, though walking there, she could see mere purple wings, yellow throats, hear their ordinary song. See how she brings the collar of her coat up around her neck as light fades and mist thickens in the cooling air, and how, even in darkness, it flashes like a cape of stars. That's the program. Thank you. Thank you.